That plan will be built on bedrock science. It will be constructed out of compassion, empathy, and concern. I will spare no effort, none, or any commitment to turn around this pandemic. Joe Biden's victory speech in November 2020 seemed to mark a turning point in the pandemic. The incoming president had a plan to deal with COVID. He was going to listen to experts and use the tools of public health. Biden delivered on some of that promise. He rolled out vaccines faster than expected in the early months of 2021. But now, just over a year since Biden took office, the outlook is less reassuring. When the Omicron variant hit in December, the administration wasn't prepared. They hadn't made sure there were enough tests for people who needed to work, travel, and see family and friends. The CDC caused confusion with its guidelines on isolation. Hospitals around the country are over capacity, and schools have been forced into battles over closing or staying open. People have largely been left to work out what to do for themselves. It's hard to see what the Biden administration's plan is, or if there is one anymore. As the epidemiologist Justin Feldman, one of our guests this week, puts it, How did we get in a situation where a Democratic president who ran in part against Trump's horrid pandemic response is letting the virus rip? I'm Alex Perrin. And I'm Laura Marsh. This is The Politics of Everything. This month, Haymarket Books has published a new edition of Angela Davis, an autobiography. This beautiful new edition of Davis's classic work features an expansive new introduction in which she reflects on the book's renewed relevance for today's anti-racist and social justice movements. First published and edited by Toni Morrison in 1974, an autobiography is a powerful and commanding account of Davis's early years in struggle. The book is available from Haymarket Books and through all good bookstores and online retailers. It's also available for the first time as an audiobook read by Davis herself. We're talking now with Melody Schreiber, who's a frequent contributor to The New Republic. Melody, you recently wrote a piece with the title, America Quits the Fight Against COVID. At the beginning of that piece, you described the moment in May 2020 when the U.S. reached 100,000 COVID deaths and Biden gave a speech. This is before he was president. What did he say and how did it feel at that moment? On May 27th, 2020, my husband called me into the bedroom and said, here's a video, watch it. I'm like, okay, it's a political ad, cool. Like, it's good to stay up on these things. And then Biden said, The day will come when the memory of your loved one will bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eyes. And he was talking about hitting that milestone of 100,000 Americans dead in just a few months. And it felt to me, as someone who's been reporting on this pandemic for two years now, at the time it felt to me as though finally a grown-up in the room understood what we were all feeling. It felt like maybe not right away, but eventually we could get to this time where we were actually taking real action to prevent more death, but also to acknowledge what we'd been through. And on a personal level, 12 days earlier, my brother died. He was 23 years old. He didn't die of COVID, but it was preventable. And when I heard those words, I I felt all the pain that those 100,000 families must be feeling. Mm -hmm. And I thought about how I wasn't able to say goodbye because we were all quarantining during the pandemic. We were all staying home. And I hadn't talked to my brother in a few months. I hadn't seen him in a few months. Mm -hmm. And I thought about what what a comfort it was to know that someone saw that kind of pain. Because often it felt like we were all alone. It did feel like at that moment, comforting that someone was at least acknowledging the severity of this and the enormous toll that it's taken on so many Americans. And that there was some hope that there was an election coming up later that year, that we could fight this, we could run someone who was going to have a response to the pandemic, to try and do something. What was Biden's promise when he was running? And what kind of approach were we led to expect from his administration? From the 
the start of the pandemic, Biden was releasing plans for how he would address it, talking about ramping up testing, surging healthcare capacity, you know, everything that experts were saying was right on. Even just acknowledging that it was happening would have been a big step. Mm -hmm. And he very much ran on a platform of ending the pandemic. That was, I wrote on the day that of the election, that this meant America was going to take COVID seriously. And I don't just mean in preventing it or addressing it. I mean, really understanding what it meant for us as a country and maybe even working toward resolving a lot of the grief and trauma of everything that happened in 2020. Another thing that's remarkable to me, just remembering that moment of 100,000 deaths and reading your piece again, is that that milestone was marked in a very significant way. At the end of last year, we passed another milestone, 800,000 deaths. And it kind of passed by in a very different way than those first 100,000. Biden's now the president. The person we thought was going to bring all this hope is in office. How was that 800,000 milestone marked? On the day that we hit 800,000 deaths from COVID, the National Cathedral told 800 times. One time for every thousand deaths, which is still just not enough. And uh, what are we doing now to take action? Where is the swift action that, that we need? I want to ask that question of you. What is the action? What is the federal government and the White House? What are they doing now about the surge? So the Biden administration is doing some things. They are requiring that insurers reimburse you for eight at-home tests a month if you can find the tests and if you can submit the receipts for reimbursement. They're... What else? What else? You know, to some degree, their hands are tied on what they can require. Uh, a lot of it is in the hands of governors. Well, that's... Yeah, right. Because that's, we, can, we can get to that, too. Because yeah. there was a moment a Biden sort of soundbite that was taken slightly out of context that went fairly viral (sighs) and in which he basically said this is up to the states. Look, there is no federal solution. This gets solved at a state level. But to some extent, even if that moment was taking him out of context, that is still the federal position here. Like they have put this in the hands of states. Am I correct? Many decisions like school closures, that's going to be up to local and state officials. And to some degree, there's a void of leadership here. If you were to say this is something that would help, then it's on the states to do that. But if you're not going to tell them what would be helpful, if you're not going to model it, then it's less likely to happen. I know, for example, other countries like Taiwan, I think, the government began directly manufacturing masks themselves. But was there there was a plan at some point to invoke the uh, Defense Production Act? to produce more protective equipment, right? In January, the Biden administration released a plan, including invoking the Defense Production Act in order to expand production of PPE, to expand vaccines, pretty much anything that you might need during this pandemic. In May, mask manufacturers approached the administration saying, now that not everyone is masking, we have all these extra masks. Would you like to replenish the stockpile? As far as I can tell, that went ignored. (laughs) Similarly, in the fall, test manufacturers approached the administration and said, we predict a surge coming around the holidays. Here's how many tests you will need for every American to stay safe. This way you could send it to them. Do you want to start these contracts now? The White House seems to have passed on those proposals, and now we have immense testing shortages. Do we have a sense of why they passed on all these proposals? I think the sense from the administration was They had won in May. Mm -hmm. We said vaccinated people don't need to mask. In July, Joe Biden said, you know, we are declaring independence over this virus. You can get together with your friends and family if you're vaccinated. They very much had a vaccines only approach or a primarily a vaccine approach to this pandemic. And the second a variant evolved to evade vaccine induced immunity, we were kind of back at square one and not prepared. Does it seem like they didn't foresee a variant like Omicron that would cause another wave this large and that they thought it would be therefore safer to just let the vaccine basically just take care of the problem? 
Vice President Harris has said no one knew a variant was coming, and that's why we were taken by surprise. If they had talked to any scientist, any immunologist, any microbiologist, everyone was saying from December 2020, we know this virus is going to evolve. We know it's going to evolve to evade immunity because there's selective pressure. Now that some people have immunity from recovery, now that people are getting vaccinated, the virus that's going to survive is going to be the kind that can evade immunity. Everyone knew that. <laughs> so it was pretty clear that was going to happen. It's clear that it probably will continue happening even after Omicron. We know there were things they could have done to prepare and we know they didn't. So I want to talk with you about what's been happening over the last month. We didn't have enough tests for everyone to do the at-home tests before meeting up with family for Christmas, for the new year, for going to work, for going to school. Didn't have PCR tests that you could get reliably or with any kind of reliable turnaround time. I actually had a PCR test that came back five days late and my husband's just never came back because Mm -hmm. they were doing the whole thing on a paper form and his handwriting's terrible. (laughs) So we think that they just couldn't contact him because they had no idea who this person was. So what I want you to take us through, what are the real world consequences of that for people who are trying to not just be at home all the time, who need to see family, who need to go to work. What have the effects been for the last month? Without tests, without knowing if we have the virus or if we're infectious, we're flying blind. You can hope that maybe you haven't come into contact with someone who has the virus and maybe you don't have it. Uh, Where I am, that's very unlikely. (laughs) One in 50 residents of my county tested positive in the past week. And you're in Maryland. In Maryland, yeah, outside of D.C. That's only PCR. Home tests, as far as I can tell, aren't reported to Maryland. And that's if you can find a PCR test. The rates of community transmission are massive, and we don't know if we have it. I also wrote recently about relying on hospitalization data. We've been using that to tell how severe a variant or a wave is. Cases might go up, but what if hospitalizations stay flat? That would be good, right? The problem is hospitalizations are more or less going to stay flat because we're at capacity. We can't admit more people in many of the hospitals we have. If we're looking at hospitalization data to see a sharp increase, we might not see it because they can't increase anymore. That is one of the most frightening things I've heard. But in the time of hearing a lot of frightening things, and I was actually just about to ask you more about hospitals. Yes. Because one of the things I have found so hard to navigate in trying to understand what's been going on in the last six weeks or so is we keep hearing it's mild. And I think anecdotally, a lot of people understand that because they have tons of friends and everyone's getting COVID and and recovering, like, you know, on the whole, a large number of these people are. At the same time, you look at the number of people who are in hospitals and seeing that hospitals are over capacity. And clearly there is a very large number of people for whom this is not mild. And that may be a small percentage of total cases, but it's actually still a really large number. So what is the pandemic like for those people? And also what are the effects of hospitals being over full in general, not just for if you get COVID, but if you need to go to the hospital? Mm. If a variant is more mild but more transmissible, it more than cancels out those gains. So if you have a high percentage of a low number, that's bad. Mm -hmm. If you have a low percentage of a very high number, that's worse. That's worse in terms of the overall number of people. The other thing I want to point out about Omicron being milder. Omicron, it seems, is milder when it comes to infecting lung tissue. So it can still infect your throat, your nose, and your other vital organs. It's only seeming to have trouble replicating in the lungs. But what doctors are seeing more and more is diabetic ketoacidosis, which is when you have complications from diabetes. They're seeing cardiac complications. They're seeing all of these complications that were present before when patients were on ventilators and doctors had to treat. But now they're just not on a ventilator. That's the main difference with Omicron. The problem is you still still need to go to ICU if you're having complications like that. So that's kind of the the tricky thing with Omicron is milder. And then in terms of what it means for hospitalization, I mean, our nurses, our healthcare workers, our janitors and cafeteria workers and ambulance drivers are 
at a breaking point. This is going to have huge repercussions for our health in five and 10 years. Mm -hmm. More immediately, I've been getting texts and calls for the past day or so from my family who lives in a state where crisis standards of care were just implemented. Mm -hmm. And they are saying, at what point do I need to go to the hospital? I'm pretty sick. Will I even be seen? One of the things I found more dismaying from the director of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, was this comment she made recently where she explained that of the vaccinated people who were hospitalized, it was encouraging that they were people who were already very unwell and who had multiple comorbidities. The overwhelming number of deaths, over 75%, occurred in people who had at least four comorbidities. So really, these are people who were unwell to begin with. And yes, really encouraging news in the context of Omicron. This um, means not only just to get your primary series, but to get your booster series. Um, And yes, we're we're really encouraged um, by these results. A lot of people reacted to this, I think quite understandably, as if she was saying, oh, well, you know, if you have a chronic illness or you're vulnerable, it's just sort of inevitable that, you know, you'll get really sick and be in hospital and that we can't do anything to protect you from that. And it seems like the Biden administration has sort of written those people off. It's it's a really sizable portion of people. I do think in the context of that clip, it, it was misspeaking, that it's not encouraging to see people with comorbidities mm-hmm. die. That's kind of a pretty low bar. (laughs) I think even saying, well, they had comorbidities and so it was inevitable is is not true. (laughs) If you stop the spread of COVID, then people with comorbidities are not going to die of Mm -hmm. COVID. Most Americans have some kind of comorbidity. But second of all, like if people have chronic illness, their lives are no less valuable. And I think that you can tell a country's response by how well they protect the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's across the bar. That's not during a health crisis. That's at all times. Really well said. Thank you, Melody. Thanks. Thank you so much. You can read Melody Schreiber's reporting on the pandemic at The New Republic. After a short break, we'll be back to talk to Justin Feldman, a social epidemiologist at Harvard, about why Biden changed his approach to the pandemic. If you're enjoying today's episode and want a regular dose of the New Republic's acclaimed independent journalism, consider subscribing to TNR with our special offer at TNR.com. Every day, our writers and editors work hard to bring you the reporting and analysis you need to make sense of the world. But we can't do it without you. Go to TNR.com slash special offer. That's TNR.com slash special offer. We're speaking now with Justin Feldman, a social epidemiologist at Harvard. Justin recently wrote an article on Medium called A Year In, How Has Biden Done on Pandemic Response? Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. We were just talking to Melody Schreiber in part about comparing what President Joe Biden said he would do if elected president back in 2020 versus what his administration has done. And I want to ask you, do you see a disparity between what... Biden said his administration would do and what they are currently doing in power. Definitely. I think the clearest illustration of this is to look at the pandemic response plan that the Biden transition team developed and that they released on January 20th, Inauguration Day. There were provisions or plans, rather, to hire a public health service corps of 100,000 federal workers who would help with things like vaccination and testing to massively increase testing capacity. There was a whole variety of proposals, and there was never really an attempt to do most of these things. And why do you think that is? You know, I remember these plans, but what do you think happened? What I think happened is two things. One, they got the first results for vaccine efficacy. And the Pfizer results back in, I think it was November 2020, Mm -hmm. showed 95% efficacy against symptomatic disease, which was much higher than expected. And the other thing that happened was simply the political realities of, well, you can call them realities, but the considerations of corporate interests and profit conflicted with some of the most effective public health measures. So they were really planning on widespread vaccination, bringing the pandemic 
down to very low levels of infection where we can just go on about our lives as normal. And that is certainly not what happened. I want to get into the efficacy politically and health wise of the vaccine only approach. But first, I want to continue on the talking about this disparity here. Biden administration and the Democratic Party's promise essentially was that elect us, we will follow science and subject matter experts and scientists will be in charge of decision making. We will listen to the experts as one of the primary Democratic Party's sales pitches. Have they followed through on that? Are health experts in charge of Biden administration policy? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very, very easy one. Actually, so Tony Fauci was ans- answering questions in, I think it was the U.S. Senate, and a Republican senator asked, who is in charge of federal COVID response? And the answer Fauci gave, which is the correct answer, is Jeff Zients. Zions is the White House Coronavirus Task Force coordinator, the number one person driving COVID response policy. He has a background in private equity and management consulting. And under the Obama administration, he was known as the ambassador to the business community for the Mm. Obama administration. Let's talk about why a vaccine-only approach or largely vaccine-only approach was so appealing to them. What is the benefit politically of saying, give you two shots and then we're done? This has been going on a really long time in public health. If you can solve something within the healthcare system, you don't have to solve it in society at large. Mm. Because addressing public health in society at large means regulating businesses, which, which means it's going to be more expensive to those who are in power economically. So when the Biden administration goes for this vaccine-only approach, they push out the vaccines, and it seems to be going well for the first few months of 2021. What's the turning point? So there was this rollout of vaccines, and then there was a moment that came when every adult in the U.S. was eligible in April 2021. Mm -hmm. And basically, two weeks later, what they decided to do in the White House was scrap everything else. That was the infamous May 13th change to mask guidance where they say, if you're vaccinated, you no longer have to wear a mask in a public setting. And you have this real hard turn to the language of personal responsibility. So the CDC director Walensky said, your health is in your hands at that point, rather than something like, we're all in this together. And so that she was emphasizing that your health is in your hands. If you get the vaccine, you will be protected. And then you won't need to wear a mask, you can go to a restaurant, you can go inside, you can go grocery shopping without wearing a mask, you can have normal life back. In the early summer, at least as I remember it, once the vaccines had become available widely, it coincided with a period of very low rates of COVID. And it seemed like everything's heading in the right direction. And then cases start going back up again. And at that point, we might expect the administration to adapt and to start bringing in some more measures. And there were some things, but it was was done very slowly. And as you write in your piece, the Biden message has remained. This continues to be a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Explain what he means by that. And also, what does that phrase conceal? In the U.S., basically CDC and White House have been saying pandemic of the vaccinated since, I think, since July. They wanted to cast the pandemic in very individualistic terms. You can make the choice and opt out of the pandemic, or you can remain unvaccinated and then have your health at risk. Let me be very clear here. The vaccines reduce individual risk considerably. Unless you're immunocompromised, you get a lot of protection from the vaccines. At the same time, the power of the vaccines has somewhat weakened due to waning immunity, and these variants are much more transmissible than the variants in the past. So while Fauci was claiming that 99% of people dying were unvaccinated, CDC's actual data showed it was something about 18% of unvaccinated people. We're now, I wouldn't be surprised, there's a bit of a lag in the data. About a third of the people dying are vaccinated. When I came across some of those figures, you quote some of them in your article, I was very surprised because you don't see those numbers being cited at all, really, in news coverage. And I think that 
there are two different types of statistic being used here. One is that the CDC and the government talks a lot about the percentage of cases. They talk about the percentage of vaccinated people getting severe COVID from all vaccinated people. But what you're talking about is if we look at the number of people who are dying, what percentage of them are vaccinated? That's a quite a high percentage. So CDC at one point had a web page and it listed the number of what was called breakthrough cases, breakthrough hospitalizations, breakthrough deaths. It removed that web page. I think a lot of the conversation around that, a lot of the justification has to do with not wanting to fuel anti-vax sentiments. But it, that's a kind of a convenient explanation. It also conceals the fact that their policies are failing to do what they're claiming their policies do, which is protect vaccinated people. I actually didn't even know that they had ever had a web page with that information because I've heard so many vaccinated people say, I just wish I knew when I see these numbers of people who are hospitalized and dying, I wish I knew how many of them are vaccinated. That would be some indication of, is there a real risk for vaccinated people? And it seems like basically if you want to get that information right now, you have to go to the States and download like CSV files of raw data. I'm an epidemiologist. I use messy data sets from government agencies all the time. So what I had to do was really dig around the CDC website, find the spreadsheet, the CSC file, and do the math myself because they they do not make it easy to find. I want to go back to the big narratives that the administration has been pushing. So we had the pandemic of the unvaccinated. And then, especially with this large last surge and a lot of vaccinated people having breakthrough COVID, that phrase has been harder and harder for people to accept or to understand in a straightforward way. In your piece, you talk about the next kind of talking point from the Biden administration being this phrase, we have the tools. We have the tools to protect people from severe illness due to Omicron. If People choose to use the tools. What does that mean? Yeah, so instead of implementing new public health policies or even pushing states and local governments to implement public health policies, the approach has been change in framing. So we have the tools often coupled with, this isn't 2020 anymore. Wait, factually true. It is factually (laughs) 2022. So the, the main tools that... CDC and the White House and media as well are speaking of our boosters, masks, and tests, especially rapid take-home tests. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea that these products exist. You can calibrate your behaviors based on your personal risk tolerance and choose which products to use when. And we're not necessarily going to give you clear guidance. We're not going to require them of you. And we're not going to provide them to you. I mean, an infuriating thing about hearing we have the tools is like the tools exist. Okay, they've been invented. We can't get them. I mean, I tried to get tests over the holidays and I luckily already had a supply of masks that I trust, uh, N95 masks, but those are out of stock where I was getting them now. And so it feels like something that is like technically true, but on a practical level, untrue. Yeah, I I almost think it's intentional. They want us to keep shopping, keep going to work, and not worry too much. And we've had communication pretty explicit by multiple White House officials and CDC that if you're vaccinated and you get infected, you're probably going to have a a mild experience and, and you don't have to worry about it. So I think the reluctance to really push Uh, better masks or more aggressive testing is directly tied into that and also directly tied in to this really year-long approach where they did not make the preparations where we could have the tools. There are shortages. Right. It seems like we needed to have stockpiles of the masks and the tests at the bare minimum to distribute basically at the beginning of December. Do you see any change on the horizon toward having that in place for the future? Or do you think this is the approach just to keep going, to let people get COVID and say, well, they'll probably be okay and they can go back to work? 
I don't think the approach is going to change considerably unless we see something like a, a much more deadly variant. What we are seeing is because of growing criticism, there are some pivots, relatively small ones. So we see things like changing health insurance reimbursement so you can get some antigen tests reimbursed. There's going to be a website set up where you can start to order a few tests for free online. But I also want to note, I've been in public health a decade. We, we know that you can't just provide individuals with tools and expect that they're going to use them. And that's going to be a successful public health strategy. It reminds me of the common messaging around all sorts of health interventions in which politicians will say things like ask your doctor about blank or go to your doctor (laughs) about blank. I just don't think there's an awareness among the political class that many people don't have their doctor and it's often difficult and perhaps expensive to see a doctor. Yeah, the, the biggest predictor of whether or not someone's vaccinated is not the political party they belong to. There is a big partisan divide. But the bigger divide is who is insured and who is uninsured. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. And that's because even though the vaccine remarkably is free, when I got vaccinated, they took my insurance. Mm -hmm. And I I think it seems really obvious that that simple fact has discouraged a lot of people from seeking it out. Definitely. And if you're undocumented, for example, and fear having contact with someone who looks like an authority figure, we find to date the people who remain unvaccinated tend to be low income, uninsured, like I said. And also there's more people in their late 70s and in their 80s who are unvaccinated than you'd expect. To what extent are these government failures, you could call them a result of ideology, of an ideological attachment to our capitalist system? But to what extent are they a result of of wanting to perpetuate the system? And to what extent are they, this is my pet theory, I think that to some extent they are a result of a tacit acknowledgement of the limits of our system. Like to say, on the one hand, we have to do things because this is our system, and then to the on the other hand to be like, well, we can't do the things that would actually help because we're stuck with this system that we have. My brief thoughts on that. One, a a good or a rather a better pandemic response than we had is possible even under capitalism. We can look at Canada, which has had uh, fewer than half the deaths per capita compared to the U.S. I think some of the main political or political economic barriers were around what you would have to do and what what we did do to try to protect people. We created a temporary massive welfare state. And what happened was it increased the cost of labor and it decreased the supply of labor. And the business class didn't exactly like that. And there, there was this concerted push to get rid of those things. Something that's come up when we were talking about this episode was that the current framing in the media is as if there are two camps of people talking about COVID. One is kind of COVID fatalism, just everyone's going to get it, so just get it and just stop. We have to live our lives, no more masks. We've had the vaccines, it's the most we can do. And then the other camp is characterized as kind of COVID zero and people who want everyone to be in lockdown and for schools to go remote for the next year And it seems to me this is a complete mischaracterization, but that it's very hard to define what the the reasonable response would be somewhere between those two. I mean, how do you tackle that mischaracterization? I think the people who are doing the painting of it as binary, they're using COVID zero as a foil, as a way to say that really any public health measures beyond vaccination are unrealistic. Especially now, but even throughout the pandemic, COVID zero has barely been visible as a political force or as something people within public health in the U.S. have have even advocated. I think what many of us have advocated is doing better than we are doing. Uh, (laughs) Right. For the present moment, for Omicron, it's very easy to make the argument that we could do a lot better. We don't have to prevent all infections We can have simple goals like not overwhelming the hospitals, delaying people's infections so we can scale up the 
production of the one monoclonal antibody that works and of Pfizer's new powerful antiviral drug. If we were to spread out the infections that are going to take place over the coming weeks, instead into coming months, one, we'd have fewer infections overall. Two, we'd be better able to care for everyone. Thank you so much for coming on. It's like really great talking with you and the piece was amazing. So thank you for writing it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You can read Justin Feldman's article, A Year In, How Has Biden Done on Pandemic Response, on Medium. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by TalkHouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Melissa Kaplan is our audio editor. If you enjoyed The Politics of Everything and you want to support the show, one thing you can do is go to wherever you listen to the podcast and rate the show. Every rating and review helps. Thanks for listening. 